So usually, many times, often, when I find myself speaking to a group of people about Huawei, um, I'll start off by saying, you know, thank you very much. Um, Huawei is a small Croatian pharmaceutical startup. And, and they'll be like, okay, tell me more. Tell me more. Um, because those are US audiences. It is amazing that this company that is 150,000 people strong, that is doing business in over 170 countries, that had revenues last year of $40 billion and aspires to revenues of $70 billion in the next three years, is largely unknown in what would be the world's largest ICT market. Um, but we'll get back to that. Let's talk a bit about the history of Huawei. I know that, that you all have a slide deck that's been distributed. Whether or not you've looked at it, don't look at it now. Um, because we're talking. And, I'm, and I, I tend to be very interactive. Um, and part of this, this, this topic is about entrepreneurship, part of this topic is about innovation. That's not always rocket science. If you look at China in the late 1980s, so we were founded in 1987, one year after Cisco was founded. If you look at China in the late 1980s, you were seeing a telecommunications infrastructure build out that was sort of like the US 1950s compressed into, oh, a couple of years. The opportunity was insane. You had 10 story, 20 story buildings with one fixed line telephone. Huawei, at that time, the founder of the company and, and a small group, recognized the opportunity. And, and the innovation of that recognition was, gee, why don't we import these PBX switching equipment from Hong Kong and sell it here in, in China. And let's not go, you know, let's not go to head to head in the major metropolitan areas where you had a lot of the Western based vendors, as well as at that time the three upstart Chinese based vendors that were all state owned. That was Great Dragon, Dot Pong, and ZTE. So we were kind of locked out of the major metropolitan areas, so we went after the rural areas. Hospitals and universities and schools, etc. And we made money hand over fist just selling switching equipment. Not terribly innovative other than the business model. But there was a recognition from the outset, this is not sustainable. And so we poured a lot of the revenues back into research and development so that within two years, we were actually producing our own PBX equipment. And it was more economical, more efficient, and extended significantly extended the opportunity associated with a single switch. But we knew we had to keep going. And by the way, that was when was born every year, more than 10% of our revenues go into research and development. So last year that was in excess of $5 billion, which is remarkable. And keep in mind, 150,000 employees, 70 plus thousand of those people are in R&D. That's more people than Cisco employees. So we poured money back into R&D in the early 90s, but we, also, we were stymied in terms of getting financing. We were not state-owned. We were challenged to get financing from state-owned banks. What happened at the time is the founder made a decision, okay, then let's, get, let's have our employees be a part of this business and also help us finance this business. And borrowing from a German model created an employee ownership plan which allowed for employees to be granted a certain amount of stock for which they paid. And they become part owner in the company. Uh, Mr. Wren, the founder of the company, now owns about 1.3% of the company. That's it. Because over the years, we now have about 80,000 employee owners of the company. And as of a year ago, a program was introduced for non-Chinese employees to also take part and benefiting from the success of the company through a time unit incentive based plan, which essentially is phantom shares because Chinese enterprise law does not allow non-Chinese to be actual owners of the company, but we, can, we are incented by the performance of the company. So now you've got this innovative model in terms of initially reselling and then being able to build our own stuff, but also employee financed, which means your employees are, 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 are part of the team. They're incentive towards our success. But we were still stuck in breaking out of the rural areas of China. The Westerns and the state-owned owned the cities. 
So we're hitting the late 1990s and we recognize we're going to have to go overseas. And we also recognize we're a Chinese company doing business in China. Generally speaking, in terms of the way that we manufacture things, the way that we operate our company, the way that we engage in terms of procurements as well as in terms of sales, is very Chinese. So another major innovative shift was inviting, starting in 1997 with IBM, and then also Accenture and KPMG and the Hay Group, inviting Western expert consultants into the organization and utterly overhauling the way we did business. So that as we came out of China and were engaging with either suppliers or customers, we looked normal. We were, we were comfortable to work with. In the year 2000, largely from having expanded into developing countries, we hit our first two billion in revenues. Not bad. Not bad. Then came the dot-com bust. We weren't terribly exposed. Um, most of our business at that time was still in China. Now, 75% of our business is outside of China. Um, we weren't terribly exposed, but our competitors were, and they were savage. There is no more Nortel. There is no more Motorola. There's what's left of AT&T, Alcatel, part of Alcatel Lucent, which owns 50% of Shanghai Bell, which is where most of their stuff is built, but that's another issue that we're going to come to when we talk about that other thing. Um, our competitors started laying off employees, and they basically slashed their R&D down the mud. Because they were savage. They were hit hard. We hired a lot of those employees, and we continued 10 plus, 10 to 12 percent investment in research and development on an annual basis. By the mid-2000s, we were a leader in fixed telecom, a leader in mobile telecom, and an emerging leader in IP-based tele telephony. In the mid-2000s, we got our first major deal in Europe with British Telecom. We continued to grow, now expanding into European markets, until as you look at, for instance, the evolution to, from third generation wireless, wideband CDMA to fourth generation wireless LTE, long-term evolution, which makes no sense, but that's okay, it was a fun name. You should have heard the first name for 3G. <clears throat> Back when 3G was being contemplated in the early 1990s, this is when 3G was a vision the name for it was Future Public Land Mobile Telecommunication Services, or known by the acronym FLOPS. <laughs> um, so LTE is actually kind of a great name. Um, if you look at that standard LTE for fourth generation wireless, no company has deployed more LTE networks globally than Huawei. And Huawei is the leading intellectual price, uh, property rights holder in the LTE technology standard. Going forward into 5G, and we'll talk a bit about the Internet of Things, or as I like to call it, and I know this is on video, and please don't quote me on this one, the interweb of shit. Um, because I'm just, it, IoT is just becoming so overused. Um, but it's real. So you look at 5G technology, we've already invested five, $600 million into a technology that doesn't exist and won't be deployed at least until after 2020. Huawei, as I said, is working now in over 170 different countries. One third of the world's population is connected by Huawei Gear. We are the leading intellectual property record holder in LTE. We've deployed the most LTE networks every, virtually every OECD country, say one, national operators are deploying Huawei Gear. And we are also now the number three in terms of smartphone shipments. But let's remember being number three needs to be taken with a slight grain of salt. We are number three with lower single digits market share, which says something about numbers one and two. Um, but you know, these things take time. Along the way, innovation takes different forms. For instance, if you look back again to the bust, and where we stopped seeing, we stopped seeing transformative innovation from our competitors and peers, and we started seeing incremental innovation from those same people. Huawei took advantage of that. We pioneered, we were the first to use distributed base stations. The idea was, and this was not rocket science. You want to extend, we are, we are customer centric at our heart. We do what the customer needs or wants, or, or, or in some cases doesn't even perceive, but we help them understand. We don't build shit just to give them shit. We build what they need. 
So we saw in the mid-2000s that there was a challenge in terms of extending range and also in terms of managing costs associated with cell sites. The model in the past had always been your antenna at the top of the tower and your base station down at the bottom of the tower. Well, with miniaturization and the ability for us to better engineer, we actually just put it all at the top. Now, that gives you greater range, but it also does something really big for you. The site, the refrigeration, the power, all the things that were required at the bottom of that cell, cell site go away, which is a great savings for, for the, carrier, the carrier community, and it's now the model deployed across the industry. When we looked at that evolution from 3G to 4G, and keep in mind, so 1G was analog telephony. That was just really shitty signals where you could kind of talk to each other, but not really well. And 2G, which was where we saw a lot of the battles beginning, um, was digital. Now, that gave you a clearer signal and some text messaging. 3G was multimedia, 4G was high-speed multimedia, and 5G is ubiquitous, ubiquitous mobile broadband. In the evolution from 3G to 4G, as our competitors, again, were challenged to innovate transformationally, because they sold 2G and 3G. So they're going out to a carrier and they say, good, great, 4G, you've got our box from 2G, and you've got our box from 3G, and here's our box for 4G, and here's a bigger rack to put it on. Huawei innovated something called single RAN. RAN stands for Radio Access Network. That's all you need to know unless you actually understand the technology. One box the size of what would have been a, I guess when I was a DVD player, you know, nobody has any of those anymore, but one box with four software redefinable modules, both in terms of the radio area interface, things like GSM and Wideband CDMA and, and, and LTE, but also in terms of spectrum bands. Because a lot of these carriers have different bands of spectrum in which they operate their networks. So what we delivered, instead of being an incremental box upon boxes, what we pioneered in 2007, 2008, starting with 2010 in the market, was a box that was backward compatible in terms of your radio air interface and spectrum band and future proof because we don't have to swap out the hardware anymore or give you another box. It's just reprogrammable. We pioneered that, the rest of the industry is still catching up. When you're putting the amount of resources that we are into R&D, you can't get out in front. They get 70,000 of the 150,000 employees in R&D. And here's the spooky part. Founded in 1987, Next year, we will celebrate our 28th year anniversary, which coincidentally is the average age of a Huawei employee across 150,000 people. We have a lot of really, really intelligent, and given that we have Americans in the audience, lightly seasoned individuals working for this company. For those who are not Americans, we try not to make any reference to age lest we get sued. Um, <coughs> It is, it, 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 the approach within the company in terms of the customer centricity, but also in terms of constantly looking forward, is something that has given us an edge and it's probably our biggest challenge. How do we continue doing that? There are people that talk about, you know, why on earth these carriers are just beginning to, de to deploy fourth generation networks, LTE networks, why are you working on 5G? Now, there are some that are quite craven that said, well, it's kind of like crack. You, know, you, just, you get them hooked on 1G and then 2G and 3G, you get more and you get more and you get more, you get more speed, you got more throughput, you got more bandwidth. And there may or may not be some truth to that. But it really is about something more practical. Because when the Internet of Things happens, which we're beginning to see happening, you're not talking about billions of people communicating with billions of, 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 of other people, but you're talking about tens of billions of things communicating with things and with people. And that means you're going to have to have a bigger pipe. And you're not talking now about you know, tributary or stream or river, you're talking about ocean-wide pipes. And you're gonna have to have more speed and you're gonna have to have less latency. And, and, and so Huawei's looking at, you know, we're the ones that are gonna make the Internet of Things possible in terms of the plumbing side of the equation. You look at a driverless car, 
and the concept of a driverless car and Google car or whoever else it is. So if you're in this driverless car and you're operating over wireless networks and you're in a 4G environment and your driverless car is in a situation where it needs to very quickly stop, over a 4G wireless network today, the latency of the data traffic over the network gives you about a stop within a meter. You're dead. Over a 5G network, it's about a centimeter. Now that's taking a real look at the promise of these magic technologies that we hear about and say, how do we actually make them work? So it's, it's, it's not about hype so much as it is building the infrastructure that makes it possible to actually deliver and realize that promise. Last week, last week, two weeks ago, I was at an event in Manhattan. Um, is a media outlet Quartz, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, is associated with Atlantic Media, Atlantic media. Um, and it was about the next billion. And Huawei was a sponsor of the event. It was really, I mean, it was, it was a remarkable event. It was really wild to hear some of these. And they had a guy from Google talking about Project Loon, which I think is really cool. Um, except for the, if you don't know about Project Loon, this is where they're putting balloons up that can deliver broadband in like unconnected places. The only thing I wanted to ask, but I really didn't seem appropriate, is where are all these balloons coming down? Um, I mean, because eventually they have to come down. Um, and I'm sure that's an issue that Google has figured out. But it was that sort of, you know, just really revolutionary thinking. But it led to, and this goes to a conversation that we started before some of you were here. It led to a side conversation amongst some of us, which is the promise the promise of ubiquitous mobile or just ubiquitous broadband in terms of the benefits to us from a personal lifestyle perspective or as, 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 as a, a, a working productivity perspective and the promise of the cloud and Huawei is a leader there as well in, in terms of taking some of the intelligence out of existing networks and pushing it to the cloud which lowers in terms of the cost of managing a network for a carrier, rather significantly lowers their costs, both in terms of initial capex and opex going forward. But the promise of all of this is hinged on a fundamental level of trust in the networks and the data. And this was a, an interesting sidebar conversation at this event in Manhattan where people were saying, oh, that's interesting. So we're, as an industry, all of us are talking about this future, which will make our lives better, easier, simpler, more efficient, more fun. Coinciding at the exact same time with a rather significant and somewhat daunting, growing consumer and enterprise crisis of confidence in the integrity of networks and data. And so this, this, this will be a conversation going into 2015 that you will see growing. Because industry has a responsibility. Those of us that are providing the plumbing and the, and the water companies that are your telecommunications carriers or your, your internet service providers or others that are providing the service and the value added, all of us have a shared interest in making you all as individual consumers or as workers or as enterprises more comfortable with the integrity of your network and your data. See, and I didn't say cyber once. Until that. <laughs> well, but it's just to make a point, just to make a point. <laughs> because the, di the conversation has been focused on the negative, the conversation has been focused on the fear, and the conversation's not been focused on the common cause and something that we as an industry should be aspiring to. And Huawei, as a leader in this industry, looks to working with our peers towards developing some sort of restoration of trust. And the funny thing is, is there are ways to get there that are really, we're a standards-based industry, right? I mean, information communication technology industry is built on standards. On the technology side, it has to be. Because it, the customers, the service providers, the ISPs, whoever they are, they want to have a multi-vendor environment. They want to make us fight against each other so that we better innovate and that we drive down costs. So in order for them to have a multi-vendor environment, they need to ensure interoperability. Well, if you're going to do that, you need standards. So we have technological standards that we compete on. 
But we also have quality standards, ISO standards, other standards in, in terms of the quality of our equipment. And of course, there are pricing standards, which are pretty easy. You know, my price is better than your price. But there are standards in terms of how it is that you engage in business. There will be standards in terms of operational standards, in terms of supply chain standards, in terms of how it is that you manage the development and the manufacture and the coding and the assembly of your product and deliver to market. There will be standards that all certifiable standards by third parties that we will also compete on. So when we, Huawei, and our competitors go in to meet with a service provider and they that's going to be fun, and they spend the time going over and saying, okay, so let's measure them up on the technology. We've got this on quality. We've got this on price. We've got this and on integrity. We've got this. Boom, this is the best deal. It's a market-based decision. So I'll, I'll shut up in a second. Um, I, although I could go on and on and I will go on and on if anybody asks me questions. There was the mention earlier about how it is that we are structured. Um, we, are, we are a very unique company. Um, so when I joined, I joined Huawei about four and a half years ago. When I was at Nokia, my last job at Nokia was the head of marketing for the Americas. Um, before that, I was the, the general manager and, and senior vice president of multimedia for the Americas. I introduced the Nokia N-series product. Um, is before there was an iPhone, yay. Um, that worked out real well. I, uh, <laughs> Nokia had a wonderful vision and, and Apple did a great job of executing to it. Um, <laughs> and, and before that I was, I, I, I was in corporate strategy and of course before that I had a function and, and similar to what I have now. Um, but four and a half years ago when I joined this company it reminded me a lot of the Nokia that I joined back in the, the mid 90s. You know, very young, very vibrant, very dynamic, very growing, uber fast, and ever so slightly dysfunctional. Um, because we were growing so fast that the bureaucracy wasn't catching up. And I personally believe that that is probably a good thing for any company. Because when the bureaucracy catches up and passes innovation is when you've, 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 you've jumped the shark. Most of you understand that analogy. Um, so we do keep, and part of the innovation within the company, within the corporate culture, is a constant reinvention. And that reinvention in the late 1990s of bringing in these Western consulting firms, all of which are still inside the company, was important to us. And the reinvention two years ago in terms of the senior management introducing a rotating CEO model, similarly, was geared at ensuring that we maintain our edge, we maintain our ability to meet customer needs and to innovate. So you have, you know, Mr. Wren is, 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 has stepped out of the day-to-day -day management of the company and is focused on our strategic direction and vision. And then you have the rotating CEOs, each of which has, each of which are, you know, incredibly talented men with their own unique skill sets and their own unique experience that act as a governing body, but every six months one of them takes that position as the, the, the rotating CEO. They each have their regular responsibilities that don't change, but what it ensures is a constant refreshing of the organization. Not, a, not any change in fundamental strategic or visionary direction. And not any change in terms of the governance of the organization, which is done by an executive management team but a change in terms of the leadership for that period of time to ensure that there's a fresh way of thinking of things. What, you said a constant refreshing of the, I missed that word. Of the organization. Oh, thanks. Thank you, because I don't know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's, I mean, it, it, from, from start, from 1987 until, until today, this company has been constantly changing, constantly evolving. And, and we know that we have to, even the foray into devices, which began about four years ago, is a part of that constant evolution. Now on the one hand, we recognize that we've spent a lot of, that our customers have spent a great deal of, of, of money in terms of the spectrum that they had purchased from governments as well as the networks that they had deployed going from 3G to 4G. And so about three or four years ago, we, we, we recognized, wow, our customers have spent a lot of money investing in this, and there is still a large population of consumers that are trapped in feature phones because of price point. Now how can we help our customers 
drive more traffic into their, in their networks because voice was commoditized. They needed to drive more data traffic. They weren't getting it from this segment of the population trapped in feature phones because the price point of the smartphones was too high. So Huawei pioneered affordable smart. And we were the first to bring in unsubsidized Android-based smartphones sub-150. So people could make that graduation move from a feature phone to a smartphone. And that gave us the ability also to prove ourselves as a newcomer to the wireless carriers globally. And so we've now come so much further that we're still delivering in the honor class devices, affordable and smart, but in the ascend class devices, high end smart. So the goal was, yes, we know we need to grow and drive new revenue streams, but we're gonna do that in the context of helping our customers. Similarly, two years ago, we created an enterprise business group. Now this is a group that was carved out of our existing infrastructure group, the, the bread and butter group selling the telecom infrastructure. What we did is we said enterprises increasingly are going to need the routers and the switches and the storage capability and the cloud-based solutions that carriers are also taking advantage of. And so we took those competencies and transferred them into the enterprise business and began doing direct business to business with enterprises and helping them build out their corporate networks. But we didn't want to cannibalize our telecom carrier customers either. So what we did is with the carrier customers, we developed and are developing basically cloud-based suites, suites of connectivity, productivity, other types of solutions that a carrier can white label and remarket to a small to medium inter inter size enterprise with which they already have a subscription-based relationship. So it's a win-win for everyone. And from a Huawei perspective, it helps us continue to grow, which is a fundamental, I mean, a fundamental goal in terms of, in addition to serving the customer and maintaining an innovative edge. And that seems as good a place as any to open it up to, to questions. Um, yeah? A two-part question for you. Ooh. I don't know. It's time for you to earn your money. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get paid. I do this out of the goodness of my heart. Of course you do. First question is, uh, is there something, that, the way the company found it, right? Mm -hmm. You started off the rural areas in China, and then you eventually expanded to the developing countries and developed. Is there some sort of advantage in that way of doing things that allowed you guys to be as successful as you are today. And the second question is, as you try to enter the United States market, and you essentially make the, like you say, the plumbing and the switching, are there still national security concerns coming out of D.C. that would inhibit your growth, given that this is a Chinese company? We're a China-based multinational. Anyway, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I just have to, that always, constantly, it's like, there's no such thing in this industry, in terms of the top level peers and competitors, there is no such thing as an American company or a Chinese company. Alcatel-Lucent, which is a company based in France, which has significant US assets, as I mentioned earlier, is also the 50% and one golden share owner of Shanghai Bell, the balance of which is owned by entities of the Chinese government, and which is doing research and development and shipping product into the US networks. But no one pays attention to that. So back to your first question. Um, and that's not, I'm not singling out Alcatel Lucent. What I'm trying to say is, no, I'm not, really. It, whether you are Huawei, or Cisco, or Juniper, or Alcatel Lucent, or Ericsson, or Nokia Siemens, or whatever they're calling themselves this week, <laughs> it doesn't matter which company you are. You are relying on a global supply chain. You are coding. We have 16 R&D centers across the planet, seven of which are in the United States. R&D does not sleep in Huawei. Coding does not sleep. One market wakes up while another market's going to sleep. When we build our gear last year, $40 billion in revenues. I purchased $7 billion in inputs of goods and services from American suppliers. And about $4 billion from European suppliers. One third of everything we build is coming from the US. How many employees do you have in the US? 1,500. But, but the important, so that's Qualcomm, Broadcom, Micron, Andrew, all these other companies that are part of the ecosystem that Huawei supports. That's tens of thousands of American jobs by extension. Similarly, I can't recall what year it was, I think it was 2008, where Cisco pledged billions of dollars investment in China to educate software engineers. That's fine, that's cool. There's not a company, and this goes to your second question, 
There is not a company in this industry that is more or less vulnerable than any other based on their geography of headquarters, period, end of story. Now, the first part of your question was, what's, uh, how, what's the development of company? Oh, well, in part it was, in part, in part it was we didn't have a choice. Like I said, you know, the, the big money in the beginning was in wiring the cities. And if you weren't, I mean, the Western, big, the big Western guys, the Nortels and Motorola's, they were already there. And the Chinese state owns had the leg up. So we went where there was business not being attended to. Now one of the interesting things, here's innovation for you, is we spent a great deal of time learning how to rat proof cables and sites. I mean, it was important at the time. Um, and rat proofing became an innovative edge when we went into the developing world. I mean, it's, you, you innovate to meet the market needs. So it, it, and yes, it did help us because it helped us grow the business. Um, but it wasn't sustainable if we were to stay in China only, which is one of the reasons we had to branch out. And, and in branching out, it's kind of like the analogy might be to how any company that comes into the, the mobile device business, newcomers almost always start at entry level and feature phones. There are very few that just come out of the box. Apple is an exception to every rule on the planet. There are very few that come out of the box with a high-end smartphone. They start with entry level and feature phone and they prove themselves themselves in terms of quality and reliability and technology and then they move up the value chain. It's kind of what we did in terms of infrastructure, in serving rural areas, serving developing areas, and then proving ourselves and moving up the value chain. Um, which one do you want to go first? Oh, um, you talked a lot about, about the importance of, of standards going forward, especially as you're seeing you know, the proliferation of the Internet of Things. I'm wondering, uh, uh, since it emerged that um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology had been uh, sort of um, undermined by the NSA in terms of its cryptography standards, I was wondering if you could speak to, yeah, I know, surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> and if this is news to you, I'm sure. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to what that has done to that you know, environment and, and sort of who do you turn to? How can NIST regain industry trust? What has that done to the TMT business? And like, uh, and who's going to set these standards specifically? Well, so on the one hand, you know, NIST was the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, which is a part of the Commerce Department. NIST was charged by the President's Executive Order at the beginning of 2013 with developing a cyber framework for supply chains. Now, this is separate, and distinct from what you just raised. Right. And in the development, that this was a really positive thing coming out of the, the, the administration. Um, now, that process at NIST was somewhat delayed by a few months because the government decided to shut down for a while, um, which is always fun. Um, I was actually working at the State Department when it shut down in the, the 90s. And I mean, it was a long holiday break for the winter time. I mean, because they happened to shut down just before the winter holiday, and then DC had this monster snowstorm which shut it down for another week. I was off for like a month, it was great. Um, and by the way, there was no government and nobody noticed. Um, so, but the NIST initiative, what's really cool about it is it's open to industry. Huawei has been an active participant in making contributions to the NIST supply chain framework. Now that framework has emerged. And there are interests now in taking that framework and moving it into international standards bodies, which is a good thing. This is the sort of thing that we're going to have to see more of because, again, there is no network that will ever be ultimately secure. Ain't gonna happen. But there are things that the industry can do to make networks more secure, which is to say make it more difficult for those that would do nasty things to actually do those nasty things. But that only works if it's industry-wide, and it best works if it's industry-led. That does not mean the government does not have to be invested in the process and also and, and co-opted in the process. But there is, a, there is a unique opportunity now for this industry to come together and work towards the establishment of true commercially and technologically rational standards and disciplines and best practices. Now, while we're doing that, that's those of us who build the plumbing. We build plumbing. Now, there's also the opportunity right now in, in, in terms of the water companies. That's the 
telecommunications carriers and the, the internet service providers, et cetera. There needs to be a more transparent regulatory environment for the water companies so that you consumers can understand, can, can know, is there fluoride in my water? Why is there fluoride in my water? How is the fluoride in my water good for me? Is there cyanide in my water? I mean, just a, tr a transparent enough regulatory structure so that consumers understand what's happening to their data. And then finally, far outside the realm of, of, of industry, governments too need to come together, and there's been good progress, a bit of a setback between the US and China in the last 12 months a couple of times, but governments need to come together and agree amongst themselves let's call them lowest common denominator norms of behavior. Um, there are models for this in the past. Um, they're not always the best analogies. You can look to the nuclear non-proliferation treaties in the 1960s. You can look to the test ban treaties and the salt treaties in the 1970s. They're imperfect analogies. But those are instances where there was a mutual and common threat that was perceived by governments, some of which were adversaries, that was addressed through agreement of norms of behavior. Not perfect, but the same needs to happen in the world of cyber. And again, lowest common denominator, I won't crash your stock market if you won't crash my airplanes. That sort of thing, simple. And if you do those three things, if you create the commercially rational, technologically rational standards that allow for the vendors to compete on a level playing field in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that actually will raise the level of, of network and data integrity, and you create a regulatory environment that allows consumers the appropriate transparency into what is or is not happening to their data, and if governments come together and agree on some level of common denominator behavior, those three things together go a long way towards addressing that crisis of confidence in networks and data and restoring some level of trust so that the promise of the Internet of Things happens. Sorry, wait, wait, wait. oh wait, I'm going to go to the other side of the room. I'll come back. Oh, I just had, had, a, had a quick uh, follow-up. I mean, what you just described, that would be fantastic if that emerged an international framework to understand sort of what the guidelines are for, for you know, security and, and what you can and can't do and best practices in cyberspace and what have you. In the meantime, you know, barring that, what can uh, Huawei do individually to uh, restore integrity you know, outside of standard setting bodies emerging to, to sort of give an outside you know, thumbs up to everything that's going on? Well, it, it, you know, and, this, and, and this will touch also on Tom's question earlier, which I never fully answered. Um, but you know, so Huawei, we are arguably, perhaps, one of the most scrutinized companies in the world when it comes to information communication technology infrastructure. Um, and, and, and while network and data integrity is a critical priority for us, it is all the more so because of the spotlight that we come under. Um, in the last two years, in 2013, no, excuse me, 2012 and 2013, we have issued two successive white papers on these issues. Um, the first one was, in October of 2012, a broad landscape sort of overview of what does this, what is this what does this cyber world look like? Where are the vulnerabilities? Where are the challenges, et cetera? And as a result, and, and, and sort of concluding that white paper, we, we called out for a broader conversation and dialogue amongst in just industry, government, and other stakeholders. Last year's white paper was a little bit different. Um, we spent the first five or six pages sort of reiterating the previous white paper, but then we spent about 20 pages saying, here's what we do. Here's how we vet our employees that we hire. Here's how we vet employees at different levels. Here's how we have many eyes and many hands on every line of code. Here's how we ensure that our downstream suppliers and our supply chain are adhering to the appropriate principles and best practices that we've defined with them and with others, including our customers. We outlined all of this in 20 some odd pages, but if you look at the internal documentation, it's, you know, yay tall if you were to print it out. Part of what we're trying to do is, so when we put that out last October, we didn't say this is the best way to do this. What we said is this is what we did. And there was a tacit invite, what are you doing? 
This year, there will be a furtherance of that conversation where to some extent we're going to be putting out a, a, a putting out a document that then says, what are the questions that a telecommunications service provider, internet service provider should be asking of their vendors? And then we might even put out what we think our answers would be. And invite comment and invite dialogue. So the goal from, from the Huawei perspective is not to, we, we're not looking to lead to the solution. We're looking to be a part of the solution. And I think there's been a great acceleration of the common cause towards finding that solution over roughly the last 18 months. Um, she, no, she, what, no, Kathy or Jacob? Kathy's been very patient. I'm <laughs> just she's got some teeing up over there. Well, I want to change the subject that we're done with. Well, this is a little bit different, but um, <laughs> God, uh, <laughs> I re I'm reading of something that's, that says a seventh of the revenue comes from Africa. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but a lot of it does. It seems like you're very involved. It seems like you're doing. It says you're, uh, the company has e-governance platforms they're working on in 18 African countries. I'm based in Kenya and I write about mobile technology, so I'm always looking for uh, uh, stories and ideas about how mobile technology is changing people's behavior in certain ways and how they're reacting to that. I guess I'm curious what you see as exciting in developing countries, not necessarily for the industry, but even for the people of these developing countries. I mean, I, I, you know, I, is, are you working with app developers to, you know, when you have introduced a $50 smartphone to Kenya? I mean, what, what, what's exciting about the opportunities this, this provides for people in, in these sorts of countries, I guess? So I mean, at, the, at, the, at the terminal end of the equation, obviously, we had a partnership with Microsoft where we introduced the Phone for Africa, which was a, a, a I think, a, well, certainly a very affordable, and that was a Windows-based device. Um, but we've also introduced affordable smart devices that are based on the Android platform, which is our, 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 our bread and butter platform on, on devices. But it's really, it, it's, it's kind of like, what we're, what we're seeing right now is the realization of promises past. An analogy would be, for those of you who've been in the industry long enough or, 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 or have had the experience, the analogy would be in the early 2000s when people were talking about the mobile internet built on WAP. I mean, come on, really? Wireless application protocol was going to drive a mobile internet? But, but it was a lot of hype, a lot of hype in the industry. Similarly, in the mid-2000s, a great deal of, of, of rhetoric about how we were going to help developing countries leapfrog the wired experience. It was rhetorical for the most part. It's real today. So going into some of these developing markets where they don't have fixed infrastructure, where there's absolutely no need to make the significant investment in the fixed infrastructure, and being able, as Huawei, to provide not just the LTE equipment in terms of mobile broadband, but also the microwave equipment in terms of backhaul, and really cool, innovative ways of, we've got one base station that, that it's, if, if you see, for instance, where electricity has been run, and we've done this in the rural southwest of the US as well, you're in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing but, but, but these poles that carry wires. We built these really cool base stations that actually clip and grab on to the wires. So, there's no, so they, just, they just hang them, and you hang them enough to build your network. That sort of innovation as well, to bring the connectivity to these developing. So it's the first computing experience that many of these people have will be with an affordable smartphone over a 4G LTE network. Now that lends itself to, and yes, we're working with, with, with governments, we're working with uh, uh, educational institutions, we're working in lots of ways to extend connectivity. Um, the goal there is, again, to bring people into society and bring and, and make it possible for people to be connected to their local society as well as their regional society and then also in terms of the, the global digital economy. All right, Kathy, you're up. <laughs> I was just curious when um, U.S. companies are thinking of coming into the China market, um, what kind of conversations do you have with them? What do they, when they're shopping around, you know, what, what sorts of concerns and questions do they have for you um, when they're figuring out how to set up and who to use and all that? I mean, I, I don't have a great deal of experience with it. Um, you know, I, I, so, so I can speak sort of generally, and generally speaking, I think there is, there, there, there are a lot of, 
how many of you before this week have been in Shanghai before? Okay, Bob. For those of you who had never been in Shanghai before, when you got to Shanghai, were you stunned? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, it's just like, holy shit, this, I mean, oh my God. You don't, and I brought many delegations over in their first time, particularly Shanghai, it's just they're stunned. They're like, wait a minute, this isn't what I imagined. And a lot of it is managing perceptions. People have a concern, people, particularly Americans, have this, they, they have a mental picture of what it must be like to do business in China. And in my industry, what we hear about most is, well, what are we going to do about our intellectual property? Well, Huawei last year was in the top three in terms of patents filed according to the World, uh, the world Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, we were number one in China, we were in the top 10 in Europe, and we were in the top 50 in the US. So again, contrary to the perceptions, here you have a company that is with a Chinese heritage, that is China-based, but is multinational, that is one of the world's leading intellectual property rights holders, and it's very important for us to protect our, our patents and our IPRs. And in China, it's become increasingly important as companies like Huawei emerge for the regulatory environment to ensure the protection of our intellectual property rights. So while there's this common perception based on maybe a reality that was 10, 15, 20 years ago, it, part of it is dispelling that perception, the same as people that would have come to Shanghai this week and said, holy shit, this is just not what I imagined. How can this, it's just a different world. And, and, and so that's one of the things is when they say, well, you know, it, well it's, all, it, it's all about theft and corruption. It's like, no, it's not. I look at, I mean, again, you, 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 a company in mind, 150,000 people with an average age of 28, and these kids, you know, they're wearing Hugo Boss and they're driving German cars. I mean, this is, it's, it's not the perception that exists in the US, and I think one of the most important things that we can do is help American businesses that want to do business here understand that, yes, they're doing business anywhere outside of your home market, or frankly, inside of your home market, is always going to be different, um, and there will be unique threats, um, unique vulnerabilities, but, but it's not what you might imagine it is. And that's our, if, if we could just take so many, if, 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 if some of these people that really want to engage in this marketplace, or want to engage in bilateral trade, going both ways, two ways, and put them in downtown Shanghai, and say, have a nice evening. I think they go away saying, wow, let's do this. You guys corruption free? Pardon me? Can you say authoritatively you guys are corruption free? I don't think there's any company on the planet that can say authoritatively that they're corruption free. We do have a, it's, it's, it's a way important issue for us. Um, in, 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 in part because of perceptions, but in part because you're not going to be successful in this business if you are, if, if you are not as corruption-free as possible. We have a business code of, of conduct that, that is signed by every employee on an annual basis, and when there is a, an infraction found, um, people are terminated or otherwise disciplined. I mean, it, 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 like any other company. Um, in a company this large that's doing business as broadly as we are, same as any company that might be based in the U.S. or Europe, there will be incidents, and when those incidents are, are, are uncovered, then appropriate action is taken and communicated internally to every single employee. Now, this is what you don't do. And that's the same, I think, in most companies of this size. Yes? Uh, I have heard many of the same observations uh, dating back to 1980 about Japan uh, and Japanese companies as they became worldwide companies from, from your, your point about IP to your point about, uh, about becoming internationalized. Uh, how, is the, how is the China experience that you know different from the Japan of the 1970s and 80s? And quite frankly, why will this, why will this with its enormous uh, uh, reliance on what I would call funny money, uh, not going to come up, the, come out the same, and seller financing, not going to come out the same way the Japanese economy did in 1990 and thereafter. Well, I'm not sure what the I'm not sure what the funny money reference well, is. Well, the funny money, the funny money is is basically uh, that uh, the the, um, the, the state-owned banks are able to lend money so that the uh, so that the, 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 the 
local government property owners can make profits, uh, local government as property owners can make profits selling the uh, right to build. Uh, the whole thing looks like a house of cards to me. And I'm sure that you've heard that, and I'm sure also that it was said that somebody like me said it about Japan. What's different? Uh, it, 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 all right, so I can't. I get, it's a, it's a great question. Now, I can't necessarily talk to, to, to the issues of the real estate market in China or the real estate market in Japan or the experience that took place in Japan and that is, some might say China is poised to experience as but, well. But, not, but when I say real estate, I, I, I should include manu the whole manufacturing industry, the over, overbuilding of manufacturing capacity, all those other um, high, cre high, high amount of credit has been, has been uh, issued in order to build things that may not be useful. That, I mean, it's, it's and from a Huawei perspective, fortunately, it doesn't apply. If I look at the almost 30 different banks that we use to finance ourselves on a global basis, more than 20 of them are not Chinese. Um, and, and, the, and, and frankly, we've got almost $5 billion in employee cash, um, which is kind of nice to have, um, and which is roughly the same amount that we have outstanding in terms of, of, of loans from major commercial banks, most of them, again, outside of China. Um, the, it's, it, it will be, I, I think that from a capacity perspective, China and Japan are fundamentally different marketplaces. Um, I think the biggest difference in terms of where, where the question started from you and, and the Japanese going into the U.S., um, and this gets tricky, I think that the experience that the U.S. had in terms of, uh, particularly in the consumer electronics and automotive industries, the experience the U.S. had in the 70s and the 80s was incredibly painful, but probably necessary. Um, and if I were to say there's, if there's any one difference, fundamental, if there's any one difference between, and this, by the way, only applies, in, in my opinion, or, or in my opinion, and for the most part only applies in the United States, um, is that these Japanese companies were perceived as a geoeconomic threat. But there was we no... We had another dimension of the same question. China is perceived as a geoeconomic threat. And? I'm sorry, what do you mean and? And is a geopolitical threat. Uh, well, okay, yeah. But that's your difference. Japan was not perceived as a geopolitical threat in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, yes, it was. It's Geoeconomic threat. <laughs> well, if you look at if you look at things like the like the incredible fear that uh, the, the U.S. electronics industry had over the control of the memory chip uh, business by uh, by Japanese companies, over the control later on the control of flat panel displays. Now we gave away flat panel displays. We, we, there were plenty of people who thought it was a terrible idea and a danger, uh, and a danger to our um, our, our uh, military industrial power. That's fair. Um, I think that they were wrong, but that's and, and, and I, when, I was, when I was at the State Department, actually, I worked on a case, uh, a, a Section 232 case, when Coors actually um, was in the ceramic semiconductor packaging business, and they were concerned that Kyocera was going to dominate the business. It's like, 20-something years ago. But you're right, you're right. In that respect, you are right. I think what's maybe then, let me let me retake everything I just said and nobody write a word I just said. <laughs> Not one word. I'm trusting you on your honor. Maybe the difference is the, the level of interdependence of the industry today. The level of interdependence of economies today. As a matter of fact, I'm serious. Take back what I said. There's, a, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to what I said earlier in terms of the, the perception of China is different than the perception of Japan because there is a stronger national security concern associated with China than there ever was with Japan. That is true. But the fundamental difference in the, in, in the business environment is the, in, in, particularly in the digital economy that exists today, but also in the, the borderless transnational nature of the information communication technology industry, and that's the key is it is borderless and it is utterly interdependent. You could not, I look at now in, the, in the, this, this crisis of confidence that has been inspired largely over the last 18 months and these techno-nationalist approaches that are being adopted in various countries, in some cases for industrial policy purposes, just using the concerns as a, as, as a veil. 
you, it, if you start building clouds country by country, and if you start driving local industries, or even in some cases trying to midwife industries in the, in the ICT industry, you will fail. And you will undermine the very nature, the very global and interdependent nature of this industry that makes it as successful as it is. If you, if you, so putting up the walls in what is a borderless world may be to some short-term benefit, but in the long term, you fragment this industry, you fragment these supply chains, you balkanize the internet, and no one's winning. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree with you on that. The Japanese were viewed as kind of imperialists or something economically. Um, whereas China is the largest market in the world, potentially. Um, so I'm from Detroit. I've heard of Detroit. Autos, yeah. <laughs> Autos are big for us. And uh, Ford, GM, and now Chrysler are you know, doing well here. And the domestic auto industry, I mean, the Chinese domestic auto industry, is, is it non existent or is there something that's holding it back? Um, I'm wondering if you have an opinion on whether China will start exporting cars in any appreciable way in the next 10, 20 years, and uh, why the Detroit 3 and others appear to be doing well here, if there's any impediments for that. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm probably not the best person to, to answer that question. I'll, I'll offer a personal observation. Um, I remember back in the 1980s, um, I had just graduated from university. My wife and I were, were engaged. We were soon to be married, soon to have our first child. We were going to get our first car, and we were broke. So we looked at the Yugo and the original Hyundai Excel. Neither of those cars was ready for prime time. Um, but it's what we, so I think that it's, but now if you look, where the Yugo, of course, is, I mean, classic as a memory, but Hyundai's done very, very well. And I think maybe, and again, a personal reflection, is we're at that level of maturity here in terms of the potential for, if not export, then overseas assembly, which maybe it's just not ready for prime time. I don't know, but it, that would be my perception. And I had a quick follow-up. Um, you, you referenced the one meter versus one centimeter. Mm -hmm. That is the autonomous, I mean, and that's what everyone wonders about autonomous cars. Where, where do you get that? Is it, basically, it's in terms of the latency of, and I can, I can get you some additional information, so you've got, in the difference between 4G and the theory of what is 5G is not just data speed and, and data throughput and the, the breadth of the pipe, but it's also the latency of being able to send and receive signals. And so it was the latency of 4G that was defined as roughly one, one meter and the latency of the theoretical 5G that would be defined as significantly less. But who came up with that? I, 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 can, I can come back okay. and get that. That's great. Um, and make sure, well, I will get you that data. Okay, thanks. And then can I ask one more thing based, based on Tom? Um, what, when you guys are talking about Japan and China, and, and, um, what is different, in your opinion, or maybe it's not, about the, about the, the Chinese boom that it won't end up in, in a, ter a terrific bust? Is there something different about what's going on, in your opinion? I, I'm probably not the right person to answer that question either. Um, you know, there's a difference again, a personal reflection and, and, and an uneducated reflection. There's a difference between the experience that Japan had and the experience that Korea continues to have. So Korea has not gone through what, South Korea has not gone through what Japan did, for whatever reasons. And maybe that's because it's a state or more of a state driven economy, I don't know. Um, but I really can't speak with any authority to why these things are different other than just the personal observation that you know, Japan and Korea didn't follow the same path. There's no reason that China would either. So there may be a third path, I don't know. Yes? Can you um, catch us up mm -hmm. on the, the history here? When did Huawei well, we begin looking at the US market? And as you look back on that, the benefit of hindsight, could the timing have been different? Would that have affected things? Could you have gotten in more easily earlier on? In other words, mm -hmm. in this age, has it provided more complexities that weren't there before? Wow. Um, so we set up our US operations in 2001. Uh, in a small hotel room in Plano, Texas, um, shared by half a dozen of my Chinese colleagues, one of which um, to this day still remembers that he did not know the difference between a bagel and a hamburger. Um, and at breakfast, there's a big difference. <laughs> um, but and, and not in college. In, 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 you know, in college, it could be pizza. But um, and. And and we did we, we you know we we did 
did well in terms of uh, building up tier two and tier three business, so not the, the top four mainstream carriers. If you look actually, the, the world's 50 top wireless carriers, 46 of them are our customers, and you can guess which four aren't. Um, but, and, and to, I would say, to, to, to their commercial disadvantage and also to the disadvantage of American consumers who would like to have more affordable and better quality broadband wireless, but anyway. Um, here's where I think it might have gone poorly for us. Um, no, 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 I take that back. Here's where it should have gone differently for us. <laughs> um, we are, until the devices business three, four years ago, we were a B2B company. The universe of our potential customers, telecommunications carriers, globally, numbered in the hundreds. And so that we didn't, you know, branding, marketing, no, we built good shit. That was it. I mean, and, 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 it, and it spoke for itself. And our customers bought it. And our customers referred it to others. And we ended up connecting one third of the world's population. Well, and by the way, there's a, there's a remarkable, and in my personal experience, um, the, the, the biggest commonality between um, a, a, a Finnish cultured company, Nokia, and, and, and Huawei is pragmatism. And I think that's, actually the Finns are probably the most pragmatic human beings on the planet, but um, I think it's an engineering thing. Um, I think it's also a cultural thing. But, but pragmatism, it, it is, it's that we build good stuff. Shouldn't that be enough? The problem with that, the challenge associated with that, is, for instance, um, if you're not engaged in branding and marketing and communicating, other people can define your brand and your image. And so when, as, as, as Huawei grew to be a global leader, and some of these political protectionist sentiments arose in certain markets, they relied on decade-old misinformation. Now, if we had been in 2001, not just opening up in the, in the United States market, but also a, a more mature global company focused on our brand and our image and perceptions about our company, then we might not have experienced some of the challenges that we have. Has the name been a liability? I'll give you one in, in terms of being able to pronounce it. No. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, come on, there are people, I mean, 12 years I was at Nokia, and still people would say, Nokia? Stop it. Um, <laughs> Why didn't you just change the pronunciation? It's Nokia. No, because actually in the beginning when I started there, in the mid-90s, we let them do that because <coughs> people thought it was a Japanese company and they associated that with quality. Huh. So well, that's what right. I, that, was the, that was the rub of my question, is that there are, you have associations with the name of it's a foreign name. Nah, that's not really the big problem, because, I mean, it's, you go to Germany and, and they, 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 Huawei. What are you talking about? <laughs> but, they, but they respect it. They, you know, it's, it's more that it, we, it, it, you know, this, the, the competence of, of communicating and marketing and branding is something that's new to us. And it's something that we're ramping up very quickly over the last four years. Just as we did the changes in terms of integrated product development and financing, et cetera, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, but it did create for us a situation where our brand, once we got in, engaged, at least in certain markets, had been defined for us. And, and, and not just defined for us, but defined for us over almost a decade. And so things that were utterly misinformed had become fact. And I'll give you one quick, we have time, I'll give you one quick a, a, a example because it's one of my favorites. Um, so in 2001, it was either the Wall Street Journal Asia or the um, Far Asian Economic Review. I think it was the Far Asian Economic Review, and there was this guy named Gilly um, who was writing for them. He's now, I think, an associate professor in the state of Oregon. Anyway, whatever. Um, he threw in a quote from some US defense official that Huawei had somehow been involved in providing uh, air traffic defense control system to Saddam Hussein, which was used to shoot down American pilots that had a wife and two and a half kids and three dogs and one cat, or something like that. Just chuck that in there in 2001. Now, if we had stood up 
and said, excuse me, <clears throat> that's nonsense. We wouldn't have had to face that story again in 2005 and then again in 2010, 11, 12. The truth is actually really ironic. So Huawei did actually try to get involved in a commercial wireless network in Iraq um, under the Food for Oil program um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, but we were blocked by the UK and the US for whatever reason. Um, but we didn't ship anything otherwise into Iraq until well after sanctions were lifted. However, in the mid to late 1990s, there was this little period of time when there was a lapse in US export control law. And during this little period of time in which there was a lapse, American exporters could self-certify that the end destination of their export was a civilian entity, and therefore, even if it was a controlled technology that was going to a controlled market, provided it was a civilian entity, no problem. Now, at this time, there was a professor at the University, Stanford University, and he created a company called um, SCM, I think, and then he teamed up with another American company called Brooks Telecommunications International. And SCM and Brooks had a joint venture with a Chinese company called Galaxy Communications. Now, the head of Galaxy Communications was a lieutenant general in the People's Liberation Army. Her husband was a general in the PLA who ran Cost In, which was the PLA's R&D arm at that time. And the joint venture between SCM Brooks and Galaxy New was called Hua Mei. And Huawei worked with AT&T at that time to ship what would have been controlled technologies, which apparently were rerouted to where they should not have been used. There is a GAO report on this. There were congressional hearings on this. There were letters to Janet Reno on this. This is all in the public record. But when the article came out in 2001, someone flipped the end. That's the sort of thing, this is so going all the way back to your question, that's the sort of thing that if we had been engaged in brand, in perception management in 2001, but we were a young company and we, like I said, dysfunctional, we were fast, we're growing, we're dynamic, we're, it, it, it's, it, all of that was going on, we were focused on, on technology and innovation, I mean, customer needs, we weren't focused on the soft stuff. If we had been, we might have undermined a lot of the nonsense that took place later in the day. Did you push back at all on that article? Then? To the best of my knowledge, no. I blame the consultants. I don't, know, I don't think they were. I don't think they were focused. And the key was in 2005, when that and this is really interesting. So the Rand Corporation, which is a go-to research and development organization of the U.S. government, um, they put out a report for the that was commissioned by the Air Force that was associated with China, et cetera, and so forth. And at one point was looking at the telecom industry and made some references to Huawei and got wrong all sorts of things. But they quoted the Gilly article verbatim without attribution, word for word. It wasn't until 2013 when the Center for Strategic and International Studies was not always a friend of Huawei, was conducting a, a, a program where they were looking at different companies and they were looking at Huawei and I reached out to Nat Ahrens who was the author of that particular thing and I said, wait, time out, you're quoting my, 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 my CEO's bio out of that RAND report. And the RAND report lifted that from the Gilly article in 2001 and didn't cite it, but it's word for word. And he's like, wait a minute, they can't do that. CSIS in 2013, corrected publicly one of the longest standing misinformation, bits of information about my company, because we engaged. Last question. I'm curious about um, if the results of the November election in the US, how does that shift the landscape for you, if at all? Personally? No. Because um, <laughs> we don't have time. Um, I don't think that it's going to really have much of an impact on, um, I, I, I'm not certain it's going to have much of an impact on the information communication technology industry. Um, we saw, I guess this week, the, you know, the Senate taking a decision on the NSA bill. Um, I don't know that that has anything to do with the re-election. Uh, excuse me, with, with the election results, although there are some that have said it, 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 it emboldened those that would have been, um, that, that would have been in support of that, uh, against that bill. Um, 
it doesn't really change anything in terms of any of the oversight issues associated with the telecom industry. Um, it doesn't really have an impact on, on the administration. I, uh, certainly it does in terms of what the president can and cannot do, and I think we'll see a lot of executive orders coming out that otherwise wouldn't have been executive orders. Um, but none of those are really going to have an impact on this industry, I don't think. Um, if anything, if anything, I'd expect that there's going to be, um, from, from the standpoint of things actually happening, there's going to be stasis. Uh, from the standpoint of rhetoric, uh, it's going to be a fun two years. Um, All right, thank you.